Today's lesson from the Gospel of John, chapter 9, verses 1 through 11. As he went along, he saw a man blind from birth. His disciples asked him, Rabbi, who sinned, this man or his parents, that he was born blind? Neither this man nor his parents sinned, said Jesus, but this happened so that the works of God might be displayed in him. As long as it is day, we must do the works of him who sent me. Night is coming when no one can work. While I am in the world, I am the light of the world. After saying this, he spit on the ground, made some mud with the saliva, and put it on the man's eyes. Go, he said, wash in the pool of Siloam. This word means scent. So the man went and washed and came home seeing. His neighbors and those who had formerly seen him begging asked, Isn't this the same man who used to sit and beg? Some claimed that he was. Others said, No, he only looks like him. But he himself insisted, I am the man. How then were your eyes open, they asked. He replied, The man they call Jesus made some mud and put it on my eyes. He told me to go to Siloam and wash. So I went and washed, and then I could see. The word of God for the people of God. Thanks be to God. Thank you. you. may be seated. So we continue our summer series, the top 15 miracles of Jesus, and we come to this, the healing of the man born blind in John chapter 9. As the story unfolds, I try to remind myself that I don't want to refer to him as the blind man. I want to refer to him as the man formerly known as blind because that's exactly what happens in this wondrous story. He encounters Jesus Christ, and in an encounter with Jesus Christ, he sees things that God calls all of us to see. His eyes are opened. We are invited to have our eyes opened. What is it that this man, formerly known as blind, saw? How can we see it and our lives be changed? I've included an outline there in your bulletin. It will also appear on the screen for those of you tuning in by live stream. First of all, he saw the healing power of mud. The healing power of mud. It was quite remarkable. I mean, Jesus Christ spits in the dirt, makes some clay, puts the mud on his eyes, says, go wash in the pool. He washes and he comes forth seen. Literally, he experienced the healing power of mud, but not just any mud. It was mud in the hands of the Savior. It was mud in the hands of the Savior. All of us need to know the healing power of mud because all of us will encounter plenty of mud in our lives. Is that way for Vicki Conway tells a wonderful story of when she was a teenager, she went to a youth camp. And one of the evenings when they did their closing devotional at the campfire circle, a man was there. And she said he had a bowl over to the side, and then he had these big chunks of dirt, clay, actually. And he began to walk around and talk to the young people about the fact that they would experience many broken times in their life. And each time he would talk about a broken experience, he would break the clumps of clay. And he would drop them into this bowl that he had. And then he would go on to talk about other broken experiences that he had had and that they probably would face in life. And he would break it together. Conway says it was a little bit discouraging to talk about so much brokenness. But then he did something wondrous. He took some water, the pitcher, and he poured it into this bowl that was now filled with these chunks. And he mashed it around. And unbeknownst to them, this gentleman had a wonderful gift. He took out some of that now clay, and he began to fashion little rudimentary animals. One looked like a little dog. He had a little torch, she said, and he hardened up that clay, and then he handed it to one of the kids. Then he made another little animal, and he hardened it up a little bit with the flame, and he handed He did this three or four times to kids around the circle, and he simply said to them, I'm here to tell you that no matter how much brokenness comes into your life, In the hands of God, something wondrous can emerge. Now, here's Conway writing as an adult, and she says, as a teen, I still remember that message today and perhaps appreciate it more now that I've lived some miles than I ever did. Friends, do you know that truth? Do you know that regardless of the mud and the mire and the muck, regardless of the brokenness in your life, that in the hands of the Savior Jesus, something else, something new can emerge? This man in the miracle saw it. 
We're invited to see it, but we have to take that mud and place it in the hands of Jesus and trust him. You know, just yesterday, Charlie and I went down to, yesterday afternoon, Southern Upshur County. One of the churches that I started in was celebrating their 100th anniversary. So in 1980, I stood in that pulpit, and yesterday I stood in it again to thank the folk for encouraging me and helping me along in the call of ministry. It really struck me, it was 41 years ago that I stood in that pulpit for the first time. But along the journey of life, I can only testify for myself, you'll have to testify for yourself. Over those 41 years, I've had to walk through a lot of mud from time to time. I've waded into some mud with people and families along the way. Sometimes I felt stuck in the mud. And honestly, sort of comes with the profession, I've had plenty of mud thrown at me from time to time. But in all of these things, friends, regardless of the source of the mud or where it is, if we place it in the hands of Jesus, he will continue to shape and mold and work in our lives. And ultimately, we will see the healing power of that mud, just as this man, formerly known as blind Saul, so also we can see. Secondly, he also saw the heart problem of organized religion. <laughs> the heart problem of organized religion. Now, I have to tell you, and I have to count on you here, John 9 is a, one of the wondrous stories of the Bible. We only read 11 verses. The story continues throughout the entire chapter, and it is a lengthy chapter. So we didn't read all of the verses, but I'm telling you, there's great drama there. Because you know what happens right after this? Those who were the guardians of organized religion of the day, known as the Pharisees, the self-righteous religious folk, right after this, and my Bible actually captions it this way, it says, the Pharisees investigate the healing. <laughs> you know, these religious folks, they heard he'd been healed, so they had to come and investigate. Number one, it took place on the Sabbath. That was a no-no. He broke a rule. How dare him heal on the Sabbath? That's work. So that was not pleasing to them. But th they don't stop there. They, they figure something's wrong. You know, they're self-righteous. They're religious people. They're the experts on all things God. And so what do they do? They bring the, the man formerly known as blind, they bring him to interrogate him. Here he's just been healed. And instead of celebrating with him, they interrogate him. Now, now, is it really you? Were you really born blind? Yes, it's me. How did it happen? Well, the man Jesus made some mud, put it on my eyes. I went and washed and Hey, I, mean, I can see. They, they said, well, that's not enough. So what do they do? They bring in the parents. The chapter unfolds. Read it for yourself honestly. The parents come in and they interrogate the parents. Now, is this really your son? Are you sure it's him? That's him. How is it that he sees? Well, you need to ask him for yourself. So you know what they do? They bring the guy in a second time to interrogate him. A second time. And they said, now tell us again, how is it that you've received your sight? And, and this man, formerly known as blind, is wonderful in the story because he looks at these self-righteous religious folks, guardians of all things God, and he says, you know, I already told you this story once. Are you wanting to follow Jesus yourself? Is that why you're asking a second time? Oh, this just angers them. We're not going to follow Jesus. We're, we're children of Abraham. We're followers of Abraham. Who do you think you are? He's a sinner, this man that healed you. And then the man formerly known as blind says, well, you know, that's kind of amazing that you say he's not from God and he's a sinner, yet he healed me of my blindness. The Pharisees really got mad then. They said, who do you think you are trying to teach us? We're the experts. And then the Bible says, they cast him out. They drove him out. Why? Because he did not meet the standards of acceptability according to their rules of organized religion. They had a heart problem. Their heart problem was it was a cold heart. It was an unkind heart. But it was also a heart that had put up the boundaries of who God was. And they had erected their own walls around God, and God couldn't operate outside their box. They had fashioned God in their image, rather than living into the image of God in which they were created. This, my friends, was the heart problem of organized religion in John 9. 
I hope it sounds a little familiar because it can happen today. Especially those of us who've been in the church a long time. We have to guard against the heart problem that the Pharisees had. We have to allow Jesus to rule in our hearts and not handmade, self-centered religion. There is a difference. There is a difference. It's still in our culture today. When I served at Wesley United Methodist Church in Morgantown, there on the campus of WVU, there was a coffee shop right across the street that I frequented. And I went over there one day to have coffee, and I noticed some college students that had been attending uh, worship. So I went over to say hi to them. There were a couple other friends there. They introduced their friends to me and said, he's the pastor across the street. One young lady looked right at me and said, I don't believe in organized religion. She didn't say hi. She didn't say nice to meet you. She said, I don't believe in organized religion. I smiled, you know me, I said, well, you know you're in luck because I'm one of the most disorganized guys you'll ever meet. If you look at my desk, you will see total disorganization. So we'll probably get along just fine anytime you wanted to come. And she just smiled and laughed with the rest. But you see what was happening there in her mind? She immediately identified me as organized religion and therefore she thought the perception was that I would be judgmental. The perception was that I would push back. The perception was that I would be unwelcoming to such a challenge. That's the perception many have of us, of organized religious people. They assume you're going to be judgmental, aren't you? You're kind of hypocritical, you know. You're pointing out faults over there, not looking at your own faults. That's what happens with the heart problem more concerned about rules than you are relationships, pointing out the faults rather than offering a remedy for the faults, pointing out how people have fallen rather than lifting them up when they've fallen. We have to guard that, friends, so that we allow the heart, our hearts to be filled with the presence of Jesus Christ. That becomes the difference. Which brings me to the third point. He saw not only the healing power of mud and the heart problem of organized religion, but he saw the holy presence of Jesus, the light of the world. He experienced face to face the holy presence of Jesus, the light of the world. Bible study side note, notice at the beginning of the chapter, Jesus says, I am the light of the world. This is a common thing in John's gospel. Jesus makes a statement, I am the light of the world. Then he goes on to demonstrate in a miracle how that's happening. I am the light of the world. He gives a blind man his sight. Uh, John chapter 6, I am the bread of life. Then he goes on to feed 5,000 people with just a few loaves of bread. That's the rhythm that you get. And that's exactly what happens here. This man, formerly known as blind, experiences the wondrous presence, the light of the world, Jesus. Leonard Sweet, in commenting on this passage of scripture in chapter 9 as a whole, He says it's a perfect example of within any given religious community, you've got nitpickers, wound lickers, goodness sakers, and light wavers. Now, I said that fast, so you've got to pay attention. You've got nitpickers. They're the ones, you know, can you believe he healed on the Sabbath? It's really ridiculous when you think of it, isn't it? Seriously. The holiest day of the year and a healing takes place, and they think it's a bad thing. They've got a problem there. They're nitpicking. Wound lickers, you know, like, a, like an animal that keeps pulling off the scab. There is that in religious communities. We won't let people heal because we keep pulling off the scab from the past. Then we have the goodness sakers. They're sort of the whispers in the background. Can you believe that? He healed on the Sabbath and then all this has taken place. Can you believe his parents didn't stand by? You know, they're the whispers in the background. But then you get the light wavers. At the end of the chapter... This man, formerly known as blind, and others, they're praising God for the miracle. Finally, their celebration, glorifying God for this that has happened. That's the light waver. It reminds me of a story of Stephen Bell. He talks about when he was a teen, he was in charge of his siblings because his mom worked nights. They lived in a trailer park, and he said, one night a terrible flood came through their valley. Panic was, was, was taking place. He said, we ran out of our house trailer. Here I was, the older teen responsible for my brothers and sisters. I was panicked. We ran out into the darkness, not knowing where to go. And he said, I looked around and I almost froze 
But then he said, I looked up on a hill, and one of our neighbors had gone up on the hillside, and he had a lantern, and he was waving it back and forth like this. And Bill says, all of a sudden I knew that's where we need to go. And I led my siblings to higher ground and to safety. I pray that as disciples of Jesus Christ, we would not be nitpickers, wound lickers, and goodness sakers, but we would be the person on the hill waving the light, waving the lantern, saying, here is the way. Here is higher ground for living. This is our call, my friends. The man formerly known as blind, he saw and experienced this. God wants us to see it and experience it and wave the light of the world Jesus for others to see. You know, some years ago, a friend of mine and I, we went backpacking in the Otter Creek Wilderness area. We got a late start, and as a result of uh, heading towards our campsite, the clouds moved in. It started to rain. We arrived at our campsite. It had already started to get dark. And so there we were, soaked to the bone, rain, darkness, holding a flashlight, trying to set up our tent. We did. We set up our tent. We got our clothes dried as much as we could, got in our sleeping bags, and prayed for morning. Well, morning came. And when morning came, the sunlight was beautiful. It was a perfect sunlit summer day. The clouds had gone. The sun was shining through into that clearing. And I remember my friend and I, we crawled out of our tent, and we just stood there like this for a while. You've done that, haven't you? When the sun's warmth was so welcome, he just stand there and bask in it for a moment. And I remember my friend looked over at me and he said, there is nothing like sunlight. No comparison. Nothing like sunlight. Again, in my faith journey, what about you? There have been many times in which I've wondered if the storm would pass. There's been many times that I wondered, will the darkness and the night last forever? But then, along comes the light of the world, Jesus. And he pierces that darkness. And I tell you, friends, there's nothing like the sun's light. This man, formerly known as Blind, he saw the healing power of mud, the heart problem of organized religion. He saw the holy presence of Jesus, the light of the world. And I pray today, here and any of you who are watching, I pray that you see it as well. Let us pray. Lord, once again, you demonstrate your mighty power through your son, Jesus Christ, as his light comes to a man born blind and his life is changed. Pierce our darkness on this day, shape the mud and mire, mold us into your people, show us the way to be faithful. Through Christ our Lord we pray, amen.